Now we're going to talk about finding the inverse Laplace transform. Again, the reason why we're using this tool is we're going to take something from the time domain, convert it to the Laplace domain, solve it more easily in the Laplace domain, and then transform it back into the time domain. So we've learned how to convert the time domain into the Laplace domain or the S domain, but now we have to learn how to go from the S domain back to the time domain. We're not going to be doing that with a formula. It's possible, but it's beyond the scope of this class. So what we'll be doing is using the Laplace transform table in order to convert back to the time domain. So for instance, if I wanted to find the inverse Laplace, notice I use that same L but with the negative 1 as an exponent, although it's not really an exponent, that's what we use to indicate an inverse function. If I wanted to find the inverse Laplace of 3 over S, I would look at my table C A and say, all right, that means this is equal to the number 3, because in this case the constant c is equal to the number 3. And now this is in the time domain. The same concept of linearity works with the inverse Laplace as well as the Laplace. So if I wanted to find the inverse Laplace of 1 over s plus 1 over s plus 1, I could think of this as the inverse Laplace of 1 over s plus the inverse Laplace of 1 over s plus 1. That would be simply equal to 1 plus, and if I looked for s plus 1, that looks like letter f, that is 1 over s plus a. In this case, a is equal to 1, so this would be e to the negative 1t. Let's do one more simple example. If I wanted to find the inverse Laplace of s over s squared plus 9, I would see that would look like a cosine, and in this case the omega is equal to 3. Since omega squared has to equal 9, if I took the square root of both sides, then that means omega is equal to 3. So this is simply equal to cosine of 3t. And of course it's going to get much more complicated than this. So let's look at a more difficult example. In this section of the notes I've included some fresher information on partial fractions. We're going to be using partial fractions a lot when it comes to finding inverse Laplace transforms. If I were asked to find the inverse Laplace transform of this, there's nothing in my table that looks like s to the third power plus s, but I do notice that I can factor the denominator. And I do know I can find the Laplace transform of something over s and something over s squared plus 1. So what I'm going to have to do is, is split this up into two fractions using partial fractions. And if you remember from Calc 2, when you split up fractions into partial fractions, you would set it up something like this, a over s plus bs plus c over s squared plus 1. And the numerator is bs plus c because I have an s squared in the denominator. So let's go ahead and do the partial fractions. And to do that we're going to multiply the first term by s squared plus 1 in the numerator and denominator, and the second term will multiply by s, and that's to get us to the common denominator. And when I go ahead and multiply this out, and then match the coefficients of the terms, find that a is equal to 1, c is equal to 1, and b is equal to 0, which means my partial fractions can be written as such. And if I go ahead and find the inverse Laplace of those, I find that I get 1 plus sine t. Let's do some more examples. Using the linearity function, we can go ahead and pull out that 4, and if we go back to our Laplace transform table, we find that the inverse Laplace transform of 1 over s plus a is e to the negative at, so if I want to put it in the same form as my table, that makes it a little bit easier to see that if a is equal to negative 3, this is equal to negative negative 3t, or 4e to the 3t. Let's look at this example. The tricky part of finding inverse Laplace transform is getting it in the form of something you know how to find the inverse Laplace transform of. So when I look at this, I think, well, this is really similar to this. But that means I'm going to have to get the numerical coefficient in front of the s into the number 1. To do that, I'm going to factor out that 3. Now I'm going to use my linearity property and pull out that 1 third, and now we see that's just equal to 1 third e to the negative 5t over 3. Alright, let's look at another example. 
this inverse Laplace is 7 over s to the fifth. Now, I do try to avoid using s and 5 because unfortunately the Laplace uses the s domain, which can often look like a 5, so I try to make my 5s look really like 5s. But looking at the table, there is no Laplace transform of 5, so I think what I'm going to have to use is e. The Laplace transform of t to the n is equal to n factorial over s to the n plus 1. So I'll write that off to the side. So the trick is making what I have look similar to what I know. So if I look at s to the fifth power and compare it to s to the n plus 1, I see that n has to be equal to the number 4. If s is equal to the number 4, then the right hand side should look like, so what I need is 4 factorial over s to the 4 plus 1 or s to the fifth. What I have, however, is this. So I'm going to rewrite this. I'm going to pull the 7 out using my linearity. I know I need 4 factorial in the numerator, so what I'll do is also divide it by 4 factorial. Now I know the inverse Laplace transform of what's in the braces, and I have the 7 divided by 4 factorial out front. So we find the inverse Laplace transform of 7 over s to the fifth is 7 divided by 24t to the fourth. What I'm trying to do is run through all the different types of examples that you'll have to do when finding inverse Laplace. Let's look at this example. First I'm going to use my linearity properties to split this up and to pull the 6 and the 3 out. Again, if I look at my tables, and again, these tables will be given to you on the exams, it looks like I'm dealing with sines and cosines. The first term looks like a cosine, and it looks like a cosine of 5t. Again, a cosine is set up for a Laplace transform equaling s over s squared plus omega squared, and if omega squared is 25, that means omega is 5. However, the second term is more of a hassle. And that's because cosine only has s in the numerator, whereas the sine has omega in the numerator. So that means I need to make sure in my numerator I have an omega. And of course I can't just add that. I need to, if I multiply by 5, I need to also divide by 5. So now I get the final answer of 6 cosine 5t plus 3 fifths sine 5t. Again, the hardest thing about inverse Laplace transforms, there's no integration or anything like that, but it's making sure that what you have is in the form of something that you know. And a lot of times you're going to have to multiply or divide by different numbers in order to make what you're trying to find the Laplace transform of equal to what you know. So the two skills you're really going to need to know for Laplace transforms from previous calculus cal classes are partial fractions, and completing the square. I'm going to go over one more property that really helps finding inverse Laplace transforms, and that's called the first shifting property. And although this is called the first shifting property, I like to focus on the fact this is a shift in s. That is, what happens if I have a Laplace transform, and instead of s, what happens if I look at s plus some real number a? What happens to f of t? Well, to figure this out, we're going to go back to the definition of the Laplace transform. If we remember, f of s is equal to the integral from 0 to infinity of e to the negative st times f of t dt. So what happens if instead of s, I look at f of s plus a? Instead of an s, I'm going to replace that with s plus a times f of t dt. If I use my exponent rules, I'll get this. And it looks like I still have my same kernel, but now instead of my f of t, I have e to the negative a t times f of t. So that's what happens. If I have a shift in s, then what happens to my f of t is my f of t is multiplied e to the negative a t. Now I often have trouble remembering whether it's s plus a or s minus a, and if it's e to the plus a or e to the negative a, but luckily on the exam you're going to basically have the answer in front of you. If you look at your table, if you look at f, I've given you that the Laplace transform of e to the negative a t is equal to 1 over s plus a. That's the same thing as a constant of 1 being shifted in the s domain. So you can always look at f and keep track 
of where the negative signs go. Let me show you where this gets to be helpful. Say I have this example. The inverse Laplace of 1 over s minus a squared. It kind of looks like the inverse Laplace of 1 over s squared if I could say s is really s minus a. Well now I know I can do that. I can find the inverse Laplace of 1 over s squared which is simply t but now I remember to, to take care of the s going to s minus a I have to add in there or let's be mathematically correct I'm going to multiply this by e to the negative a and in this case the a is actually negative so it's negative negative a to the t power so the inverse Laplace transform of 1 over s minus a all squared is simply t e to the positive a t. I could have also solved this by doing partial fractions but to be honest it's a lot more work than simply recognizing that I had a shift. Let's look at another example that really is much much easier recognizing the shifting property. Now I kind of teased how we're going to have to use completing the square but you might have thought well we haven't had to use it yet but this is where we're going to be using completing the square. I don't have anything on my table that looks like 1 over s squared plus 4s plus 8 and I don't think this is factorable evenly. So let's complete the square and when I finish this you might think well that really is no better than what I had but actually it is because this is just equal to the inverse Laplace transform of 1 over s squared plus 4 if I let s be replacing s plus 2. So I go ahead and find the inverse Laplace transform of this. Again this is going to be a sine so I need to get a an omega in the numerator which means I'm going to have to divide by that same numerator out front so this is equal to 1 half times sine of 2 t times now I'm going to take care of that shift e to the negative 2 t. This is one I would not have been able to solve without knowing the shifting property. So to solve all of these types of problems all these inverse Laplace transforms you'll need the you'll need the Laplace table partial fractions and completing the square and be able to manipulate algebraically to get what you have into terms of something that you know.